the Watchers. The Watchers appear multiple times throughout various books of the Bible. In the book of Daniel, the Watchers are holy ones who reside in heaven. Daniel described how a Watcher told him the evil King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon would eat grass and go insane. However, in the book of Enoch, an apocalyptic text that isn't considered biblical canon, the Watchers are fallen angels. Enoch describes how a group of angels known as Watchers are tasked with watching over humanity. These angels were not so holy after all. As they observe human society grow, they become jealous and full of lust. They begin desiring human women, and at the behest of their leader, the angels start procreating with them. These angels, sent by God to simply watch humanity, become intermingled with human females. They then go on to create half-human and half-angelic beings known as the Nephilim. This is where things in the Earth's history start to take a dark turn. The creatures called the Nephilim are hardly holy and not even close to human. They become savage giants that storm across the globe, pillaging and killing, endangering humanity. Taking pity on their offspring, the Watchers then agree to teach the Nephilim and the humans forbidden knowledge. They train the humans in things like sorcery, advanced technology, weaponry, and other wonders they would later use for evil. Eventually, the world is thrown into such chaos because of the lustful angels that God is forced to bring about the Great Flood. God purges the world of the Nephilim and saves only Noah so that the entire human race isn't obliterated. At the same time, God takes the Watchers and binds them in the valleys of the Earth, where they are supposedly still waiting for Judgment Day. Samyaza Samyaza is an evil angel whose name roughly translates to the infamous rebellion. He has been compared to Satan, although most Christian texts agree they were not the same being. Instead, Samyaza was just another of God's fallen angels who rebelled against heaven and gave forbidden knowledge to humanity. Samyaza was the leader of the Watchers in the Book of Enoch, and he was responsible for allowing them to breed with humans. Samyaza orders the rebelling angels to meet atop Mount Hermon, according to the Book of Enoch. This is where they begin their secret society of 200 evil angels, which are sometimes known as the Grigori. Samyaza names himself the Chieftain, forsakes his allegiance to heaven, and he, along with the other Watchers, bind themselves to their treachery. They agree to do whatever it takes to satisfy their carnal desires, and they have their way with the humans. We already know that the Watchers gave their forbidden knowledge to humanity, but it was Samyaza behind the whole thing. He began an era of domination, and with Samyaza as their leader, the fallen angels and their offspring took over the world. They exploited and murdered the ordinary humans God had created because they weren't part angel. In the Book of Giants, Samyaza is described as fathering Oya and Haya, a pair of Nephilim. In the same book, Samyaza suffers a different fate than in the Book of Enoch. After he and his sons battle the Leviathan, they are defeated by the four punishing angels who slay them for their treachery against God, Arakil. Arakil is the second to be mentioned of the 20 leaders of the 200 Watchers depicted in the Book of Enoch. The leaders were tasked with keeping law and order over the rest of the fallen angels. Enoch describes Arakil teaching the humans the signs of the earth, which most historians have interpreted as geomancy. In ancient days, people believed the future could be seen if one could only understand the patterns of the earth. For example, oracles could throw a handful of dirt on the ground, look at the lines and textures, and immediately understand events that were soon to come. This was the forbidden magic called geomancy, which Arakil passed along to the humans. However, not much else about this fallen angel is known, other than that he lived during the days of the patriarch Jared, the father of Enoch who described the events in his writings. Jared lived for 962 years, in the days when the angels of the Lord descended to the earth. Surprisingly, he isn't only a figure in the wildly controversial Book of Enoch, he's also mentioned in the Book of Genesis and the apocryphal Book of Jubilees, Cocobiel. Cocobiel is another despicable watcher who ruined the world of men. His name translates to Star of God, and he is the fourth leader of the fallen angels. Arakiel taught geomancy to the humans, but Cocobiel revealed to them the secrets of astrology. He's an old name in biblical lore, and is believed to be the one who taught the ancient Sumerians astronomy. However, nobody knows how that would be possible, given the timeline between the imprisonment of the watchers and the rise of modern civilization. 
Many religious scholars believe Cocobiel may have been inspired by a much older deity whom the Sumerians associated with cosmic knowledge. Cocobiel is described in more detail than some of the other watchers. He is depicted as an extraordinarily large human-like being, about as tall as the Empire State Building, which stands roughly a thousand feet, 300 meters high. But unlike his fallen angel brethren, Cocobiel may have been asexual, with no reproductive organs and no face. However, he did have six black wings, just like God's seraphim. Various legends say that Cocobiel taught humans gods and even monsters about the stars and celestial bodies. He also showed humans how to use mathematics, chemistry, and physics to understand their evolution as well as their origins. Some even say that his seemingly infinite knowledge of the cosmos made him go completely insane. Penemu. The celestial being Penemu appears only in the Book of Enoch as one of God's fallen angels. However, his role in the destruction of humanity and the creation of the Nephilim is controversial. It's unclear whether he was truly an evil angel or if he was just a desperate savior of humanity. Some say Penemu didn't do any harm to humans because nowhere in the book does it say he murdered anyone or gave humans forbidden knowledge. Instead, he showed mankind the secret wisdom of reading and writing, potentially in hopes of inspiring them and leading them away from darkness. All it says in the Book of Enoch is that Penemu taught men the art of writing with ink and paper. However, it does go on to say that humans were not designed for such an art. Men were not originally created to understand reading or writing. Without the ability to create stories on paper, there was a small chance anyone would doubt God or sin. For this reason, the gift of writing is seen by some as an act of evil, making Penemu just as bad of a watcher as the rest of the fallen angels. Do you think Penemu teaching humans how to read and write did more harm than good? Let us know what you think in the comments down below, and while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. Mastema Mastema appears in the Book of Jubilees, first as a kind of executioner who works on God's behalf, and later as more of a demonic figure. Mastema's duty is to carry out punishments against humans who sin and deny God as the creator of all things. It's also Mastema's job to tempt humans to sin, thereby testing their faith. He basically holds something tantalizing in front of them to see if they'll take it, and then he punishes them if they do. Mastema appears in several other texts, and his personality is always a little different. In the Dead Sea Scrolls, he's described as the angel of disaster, the father of evil, and a flatterer of God. It's in these scrolls that we see Mastema give in to his own selfish temptations and separate himself from heaven. Later in the Book of Jubilees, long after Mastema fell from grace, he becomes the chief ruler of all of the Nephilim. Although he was not a Nephilim himself, he took command of their forces. Then, when God was ready to flood the world and get rid of the abominations created by his fallen angels, Mastema intervened. He begged God to allow him to keep at least one-tenth of the demons he had been commanding. However, God denied him the opportunity, but allowed Mastema to continue testing the strength of men. During the narrative with Abraham, Mastema is the one who suggests to God that he should ask him to sacrifice his own son, Azazel. Azazel is a lot of things in religious texts. In the Christian and Islamic traditions, he's a fallen angel, but in Jewish lore, Azazel is the name of a desolate landscape. This is where the goat holding the sins of the Jews is sent during the first Yom Kippur. It wasn't until later that Azazel became a fallen angel in the Christian narrative and was demonized as the most evil angel of them all. He was supposedly the one responsible for human beings receiving some of the most tainted knowledge of the Watchers. The name Azazel appears in passing in the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Book of Giants, but it's in the Book of Enoch that we get the full story behind the angelic being. Like all the main Watchers, Azazel had secret wisdom that he wanted to bestow upon humanity. He was responsible for teaching them the secrets of witchcraft. Azazel showed human beings how to wield magic, which corrupted them down to their very souls. Warfare, astrology, geomancy, and the art of writing all played a part in corrupting humanity, but witchcraft was the worst of them all. Men and women were led to wickedness and impurity, from which they could never return. Azazel was such a villain that he was given special treatment when God banished the Watchers into the valleys of the earth to wait for Judgment Day. 
Archangel Raphael bound Azazel by his hands and feet, chained him to the rock of Judale, and left him there in utter darkness to await the apocalypse. Supposedly on the day of reckoning when the seven seals are opened, Azazel will be released from his dark prison, only to be thrown into the fire and consumed forever. One passage that sums up Azazel really well comes from the Book of Enoch. Chapter 10, verse 8 reads, The whole earth has been corrupted through the works that were taught by Azazel. All sin is ascribed to him. Bezalel Bezalel is the thirteenth watcher described in the Book of Enoch. He's considered the Angel of the Shadows, sometimes referred to as the Shadow of God. Most interpretations of Bezalel depict him as a kind of personified shadow, making him one of the most mysterious of all the evil angels. And because of his mystique, Bezalel was ordered by the leader of the Watchers, Samyaza, to observe all of creation and report any useful information back to him. Unfortunately, there isn't much else to say about Bezalel. Like so many minor demons, his name is very rarely mentioned in any ancient texts. He's so seemingly unimportant that many scholars have left him off the official list of the 20 most important watchers. When theologian Robert Henry Charles translated the Book of Enoch in 1906, he didn't even mention the fallen angel, Gadriel. One of the most despised fallen angels in the Book of Enoch is Gadriel. He taught humanity the art of using cosmetics, something that would have been a pretty big deal 4,000 years ago when the book was supposedly authored. Some have blamed Gadriel for bringing the knowledge of vanity into the world and how a person can change their face using cosmetics. Gadriel was also the fallen angel who showed humans how to use weapons and taught them how to wage war against one another. Like many of the other fallen angels, Gadriel had twelve black wings and was massive in size. He also had ageless beauty and looked like a smooth marble statue. His hair was bright blonde, almost golden, and his eyes shined an intense shade of red. The corrupted angel Gadriel was said to be the original guardian of the Garden of Eden, charged with keeping unwanted guests out before Archangel Uriel took over the position. Shamziel Shamziel is described as the sixteenth leader of the Watchers that followed Samyaza into darkness and betrayal. His name means Son of God, and he was responsible for teaching men and the Nephilim the Songs of the Sun. He lived during the days of Enoch's father Jared, and appears in a lot of religious texts and ancient legends. It's believed Shamziel may share mythological basis with Shamash, who was the Babylonian god of the sun. Many people aren't aware that a lot of pagan gods are based on some of the worst demons in the Bible. Gods worshipped by the Canaanites, the Babylonians, the Sumerians, and even the Egyptians were most likely some of these evil fallen angels. As a way for early Christians to discourage the worship of pagan deities, scholars believe they started turning them into demons. As the years went on, many old gods like Shamash lost their credibility and were demoted to minor entities in biblical tales. In the Zohar, the source of all Jewish mysticism known as Kabbalah, Shamziel is also an important character. He's described in the sacred Jewish text as the guardian of Eden during Adam and Eve's expulsion and a leader of 365 legions of angels. Because of the discrepancy between sources, nobody really knows if Shamziel was a fallen angel or a good angel. Like many religious figures, Shamziel is one thing in Christian mythology and something totally different in Jewish legends. Elijah taken to heaven There are no less than three important biblical characters who may have had contact with extraterrestrial beings. Two of them were taken to heaven and were never seen again, and the third one witnessed what some say is evidence of spaceships on Earth. Let's first discuss Enoch. In the book of Genesis, it's said that Adam lived for 930 years, then his son Seth lived for 912 years, and Seth's son Enoch lived only 905 years. Lives continued to be shortened up until the time of Enoch, just before Noah and the Flood. Enoch didn't die though, he was taken away. He lived a total of 365 years, and then according to the book of Genesis, Enoch went with God and then he was no more because God had taken him away. But the Bible never says where he went, only that he was taken and never returned to the planet. The same thing happened with the prophet Elijah. He and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal when the Lord took Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. And if you think that's insane, the story of Ezekiel is even more bizarre. 
He details an encounter with UFOs thousands of years ago. In the Bible, Ezekiel says that he saw a windstorm come up from the north. There was a great cloud of flashing lights, and at the center of the cloud were what looked like glowing hunks of metal. There was fire inside the cloud, and four living creatures in human form. This sounds an awful lot like spaceships, but what do you think? Let us know in the comments. Noah's Space Ark What if Noah was an alien and his ark was a spaceship? According to the Bible, before the days of Noah, the world was deep in depravity. God's creatures, the living things he'd created to occupy the earth, weren't behaving in the way he'd intended. His beloved creatures were being wicked, and they were corrupted by murder, greed, envy, lust, and plenty of other sins. But if you look at it from a more scientific angle, it almost sounds like a scientist being unhappy with his biological experiments. It seems like an advanced being created humans as part of an experiment, and after giving them free will, he was displeased with the way they acted. Then, when God, or the bioengineer from another planet, saw his creatures were hopeless, he sent a flood to wash him off the face of the earth. The story of the flood can be interpreted either way, but whether it was an omnipotent being named God or a group of aliens experimenting with a new race of intelligent apes, the ending was the same. Noah rounded up the natural animals in a vast ark and protected them until the flood waters receded. Then the architect got back to work, creating better humans. Noah's sons were supposedly responsible for repopulating society, but in order to fit all those animals in his ship, he would have needed an extremely large boat. What if he was one of the creators, and he used a massive spaceship to protect the planet's animals while human beings were reset? The Creepy Angels In the book of Genesis, the Nephilim are described as mighty men. They were a group of giants birthed by human women who were impregnated by corrupted angels. We get another description of them in the book of Numbers, in which the Nephilim are said to be so big that to them, Ordinary humans look like grasshoppers, but by far the best description of these strange creatures comes from the Book of Enoch. This book was allegedly written by the grandfather of Noah over 10,000 years ago. Enoch described how the angels were sent down to the realm of humans to look after them on behalf of God. However, instead of doing their jobs, the angels became lustful for human women, joining them in an unholy union. This act led to the creation of abominations otherwise known as the Nephilim. They were huge giants that were so big they could crush ordinary people under their feet. They were half angel and half human, but they turned against humanity and tried to devour them. The Nephilim became so corrupt that they turned to cannibalism, drank one another's blood, and were just generally awful. If the Book of Enoch is to be believed, the Nephilim were primarily responsible for God flooding the planet. But just how real were the giants? In 1577, a collection of bones was found in Switzerland. They were so big that people believed they came from a biblical giant that stood 19 feet 6 meters tall. However, in 1786, German scientist Johann Friedrich Blumenbach realized the skeleton belonged to a woolly mammoth. So, the unfortunate truth is that no official giant skeletons have ever been found. Resurrection Everywhere Jesus Christ was hardly the only person to be raised from the dead in the Bible. In the Old and New Testaments, resurrections are a dime a dozen. It happened so frequently, you might think they had a bit of a zombie problem back then. The very first biblical account of someone being raised from the dead is the son of the widow in Zarephath. The widow's son gets sick, and his illness eats away at him from the inside. Then he dies. The widow blames Elijah and God for taking her son away, and so Elijah cries out to God and stretches himself over the boy's body. He asks God to give the child's life back, and God does exactly that. But there are plenty of other examples of God playing the role of necromancer. Lazarus is a perfect example. When Lazarus gets sick, his sisters send for Jesus to come and heal him. However, Lazarus dies anyway. By the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus has already been dead for four days. Jesus goes to his tomb and tells whoever's guarding it to open it. Then, Lazarus walks out from the tomb alive after being commanded by Jesus to return to the earth. Even Paul raised somebody from the dead in the book of Acts. As Paul speaks to a group of people about the gospel, a man named Eutychus falls three stories from a window after falling asleep, resulting in his death. Paul rushes through the crowd and throws his arms around a young man. He then proclaims that he's alive, and everyone that witnessed the miracle celebrates. The War of Angels 
The story of Lucifer's rebellion is told in the New Testament of the Christian Bible. In the book of Revelation, we learn of a war in heaven that was waged between the angels and the devil's army. The angels were led by the mighty archangel Michael, while Lucifer led the rebellion against God. The tale of Lucifer's fall comes in many different forms depending on where we are looking. In the Armenian, Georgian, and Latin versions of the story of Adam and Eve, Lucifer rebels after the creation of Adam. Lucifer doesn't wish to bow down to humans. It's even the same story in the Islamic version of the Bible. Iblis, the Islamic leader of the devils, refuses to bow down to Adam in the garden. Another version is that Lucifer refused to become a subject of God's son, and so he rebelled. But no matter what his motivation was, the story ends the same every single time. War was waged in heaven between Lucifer and Michael, along with all their respective angels. And in the end, Lucifer was defeated and cast down to hell. However, many biblical scholars believe the war in heaven was a sneaky reference to the spiritual warfare being fought in the early days of the church. It may have been a symbolic event that really happened, likely a reference to the war between paganism and Christianity. It's shout out time! We wanted to give a huge thank you to Paul Britt and Blender Study for watching and supporting Origins Explained. We really appreciate your feedback. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Biblical Time Travel the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is notorious for having more forbidden books of the Bible included in their biblical canon than just about any other mainstream church. In one of these forbidden texts, for Baruch, there is what appears to be a tale of time travel. The text was taken out of the book of Jeremiah and is considered a fraud by everyone except the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. According to ancient astronaut theorist Eric von Daniken, the story is a biblical example of time travel. In the text, it says that prophet Jeremiah is sitting with several of his friends, and with them is a young boy named Abimelech. Jeremiah tells the boy to leave Jerusalem, but tells him where he can find a hill covered in figs. He then orders the boy to collect the fresh figs and bring them back for him and his friends to eat. So the boy goes and collects the figs, but on his way back, Abimelech encounters something strange. There's suddenly a blast of noise around him, accompanied by a swirl of wind, and he blacks out. When he wakes up, he runs back to the city and finds it full of strange people. When Abimelech asks where Jeremiah is, an old man tells him that Jeremiah hasn't been around for 62 years. There are a handful of versions of the text, with Abimelech's sleep ranging from 60 to 70 years. Many biblical scholars have interpreted the time warp as representing the history of the Babylonian captivity. This was when Judeans were kept as slaves and prisoners of the Babylonians for about a century. However, others say Abimelech's story may have been a real example of accidental time travel. The Dragon There's a piece of the Book of Daniel that was removed for not being authentic enough by the Catholic Church. The forbidden piece of text is called Bell and the Dragon. It was cut from the Protestant Bible, but it did make it into the King James Bible. The story is a strange one because some say it has to do with an ancient Mesopotamian deity called Marduk and his faithful dragon. In Mesopotamia, Marduk, son of Enki, was one of the most important gods, the equivalent of Zeus in the Greek pantheon. He was the patron god of Babylon and presided over justice, fairness, and compassion. He was also seen as the god of storms and was worshipped as the agricultural deity. His temple was likely the model for the biblical Tower of Babel. He also happened to have a monstrous reptile named the Meshusu Dragon, which we can see depicted on the magnificent Ishtar Gate of Babylon, built around 575 BC. In Bel and the Dragon, Bel is a statue worshipped by the Mesopotamians, meant to represent Marduk. Daniel goes about trying to convince the statue worshippers that they're doing the wrong thing by worshipping a false idol. In the end, though, the statue is destroyed and Daniel is thrown into a pit of lions. The Burning Garbage Dump What if hell wasn't what you thought it was? Instead of being a fiery pit of damnation where you would go to burn for all of eternity, what if hell in the Bible was just referring to a garbage dump in ancient Jerusalem? The thing about the Bible is that it's full of secret meanings, metaphors, and vague analogies. Jesus may not have been warning people about a realm of fire and brimstone, but rather of a filthy burning garbage dump in Gehenna. 
In Matthew 5:29, Jesus warns that if a person sins, they'll go to hell. He says if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. Jesus warns that it's better to lose one part of your body than for all of you to be thrown into hell. However, the word hell in this context is a direct translation from the Greek word Gehenna. In ancient Jerusalem, Gehenna also happens to be the name of the place where they burned their garbage. Legend has it there was so much trash in Jerusalem being burned that the fire raged day and night. There's a chance that when Jesus warned that a person could wind up in hell, he really meant in a flaming garbage dump where they would suffer for all of eternity. The Horned Moses Apparently, Moses had horns. There's no easier way to say it. The very man who received the Ten Commandments from God at the top of Mount Sinai in Egypt and returned the Israelites to the Promised Land had horns. All throughout the ancient world, Moses was depicted in art as having two horns sprouting from his head like the devil. One of the most famous of these depictions is Michelangelo's Moses, which today sits in the tomb of Pope Julius II in St. Peter's Basilica. For the last 2,000 years, people just kind of accepted that Moses had devil horns. But why in the world was this ever a thing? Historians say the idea of Moses having horns likely started with the Vulgate Bible. This was a Latin translation created by St. Jerome in the 4th century AD and would later become the Latin Bible up until 1979. It was arguably the most important Bible ever written. When St. Jerome was translating, he was likely a little confused on how to translate rays of light from Hebrew to Latin. Instead, he described Moses as having a horn since it was fairly similar in shape. However, the terrible translation ended up giving Moses a pair of horns for the next few centuries. The translated Bible was mass-produced, and people just accepted that Moses had horns like a goat. The Gospel of Mark The Gospel of Mark has one of the strangest endings of any biblical book. The narrative ends so abruptly that scholars doubt its authenticity. Many believe the current Gospel of Mark was somehow changed, and that the original version had a longer and more complete ending. It's as if somebody cut the author off in the middle of their sentence. It's especially jarring if you read the Gospel in one sitting from beginning to end. You get into the groove of it, then all of a sudden the ending throws you way off balance. The theory is that the final verses are not the original text and that they may have been altered from what was originally written. The Gospel of Mark ends like this, And they fled from the tomb, for fear and trembling had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is a reference to an event that happens after Jesus Christ is crucified. Mary Magdalene and her companions traveled to his tomb, only to find that his body had been removed. And there before them was a young man who none of them had ever seen before. He told them Jesus of Nazareth had risen and that Mary should tell his disciples that he'd gone up to heaven. The Gospel then ends with Mary and her disciples leaving the tomb and saying nothing. It's an extremely odd ending and many people suspect there's much more to it. But what happened to the original script if there was more at the end of the Gospel? At the moment, it seems to be a mystery. The Global Flood Scientists have estimated that by the year 2100, we will face a global flood the likes of which hasn't been seen for almost 10,000 years. I'm talking about a biblical flood, and this time Noah isn't around to save us. According to engineer Ian Young from the University of Melbourne, scientists are still trying to understand just how massive the impact will be of the unavoidable incoming flood. It's definitely going to happen by 2100, and it has the potential to kill 600 million people and leave the world in absolute chaos. That's the number of people who live on coastlines around the globe, in an area within 32 feet, 9.7 meters above sea level. But that's only getting started. Even if almost 10% of the world population is wiped out by the coastal flooding, there are the storms and wild weather events to think about as well, which will cause even more damage. Plus, worst-case scenarios could see floods happening inland, totally drowning entire cities that aren't even on the ocean. But there's something else that a lot of people don't talk about. If a huge portion of the world is suddenly underwater, there will be millions of people fleeing from the chaos, which will result in mass migration, hysteria, violence, and global-scale madness. The year 2038 In 1999, everybody thought the world was going to end in 2000. 
The general idea was that the dates on all the computers would reset and the world would be plunged into the year zero, but it never happened. Y2K was a bust and the world went on spinning. But now there's a new problem that not so many people are aware of. It's called the year 2038 problem and it has to do with the C programming language. This programming language uses a library of routines known as the standard time library. It's quite complicated, but boils down to a 4-byte format for the storage of time values, number functions for converting, and the display and calculation of time values. Now things get really complicated. The format assumes that the beginning of all time is January 1st, 1970, 12 a.m. It's a convenient format, but one that will inevitably reach a maximum value of time and then roll over to a negative value. It'll happen on January 19th, 2038. Theoretically, the problem can be fixed by converting all the 4-byte formatting to 8-byte formatting. Theoretically. Another theoretical happens on the day of expiration if the problem isn't fixed, and suddenly every clock is thrown back to December 1910. This could affect flight navigation systems, power grids, and we could see massive system failures across the globe. While it might not destroy the world in and of itself, it could lead to what cybersecurity experts like Mika Hypanen have called the digital Pearl Harbor. Volcanic Chain Reaction Our planet's crust is broken into 17 rigid tectonic plates. It's a difficult thing to imagine, but try to follow me here for a second. The massive crust around our planet, its plates, they're all floating on a much hotter and much softer layer in the mantle. These plates shake and shift around, and that results in volcanoes and earthquakes. The issue is that we don't live on a solid planet. It's all molten rock and iron fueling the nuclear reactor in the center. And surrounding that molten mantle is our crust. This is important to know because we're about to talk about a chain reaction that could kill all life on Earth. At the places where the tectonic plates touch, or nearly touch, there are volcanoes. The ruptures between the plates is what allows for the molten fire from the mantle to squeeze all the way up to the surface. According to American researcher Stephen Petronek, even just one eruption from a sizable volcano could cause a chain reaction setting off other volcanoes at the breaks in the tectonic plates. What you might not know is that throughout the history of our planet, 98% of every species that ever lived has gone extinct. Volcanoes are the biggest reason why. The biggest extinction event of the Triassic period was caused by a string of volcanoes that all went off at the same time, like accidentally lighting the whole box of fireworks on fire. Volcanoes stretched from New Jersey to Morocco, and all of them exploded at once and killed 95% of life throughout the oceans and on land. If something similar were to happen today, humans would very likely be toast. The atmosphere will be full of so much carbon dioxide, the only way anyone could survive being outside would be with a gas mask. The overpopulation equation. Heinz von Forster was a brilliant physicist, an eclectic philosopher, and a man who used his knowledge and suspicions of the world to predict doomsday. He recently died at the age of 90, only a few years before he believed the world was to come to an end. Just like the cultists over at Messiah Foundation International, he thought the world would end in 2026, on November 13th to be exact. However, his reasoning was wildly different and had nothing to do with an asteroid. Instead, Heinz von Forster believed the world would crumble around us because of overpopulation. Heinz von Forster was a native of Vienna. He got a doctorate at the University of Breslau, and he disguised his Jewish heritage so that he could work at a Berlin radar lab during World War II. He moved to the US in 1949 and worked at the University of Illinois. He even founded the university's biological computer laboratory. He came up with his doomsday equation in 1960. At the time, the population was about 2.7 billion, he and some of his colleagues predicted that population growth would become infinite by approximately November 13th, 2026. The world wouldn't necessarily end at that date, but it would be a tipping point. By 2026, this brilliant professor believed 
There would be so many people on Earth that it would be impossible to slow down birth rates, and that would result in an overwhelming of the food system and a total collapse of the natural world. WR-104 Starburst There's a star about 8,000 light-years away from us called WR-104, and it could very well be the end of all existence on our planet. This star could explode at any minute, literally. It's ripe for a complete core collapse and supernova event. It would be the closest supernova to ever occur in humanity's history. And according to astronomer Grant Hill from the WM Keck Observatory in Hawaii, it could happen either tomorrow or 500,000 years in the future. There is absolutely no way to exactly determine when the star will go supernova. What we do know is that when it happens, Earth is directly in its path. This star will emit an incredible burst of gamma radiation. You know, the stuff that made the Incredible Hulk. And all of that radiation will be blasted like a laser beam directly at our planet. If this sounds terrifying, that's because it is. It could wipe out a huge part of the protective atmospheric ozone that surrounds us, at which point we will be highly susceptible to the heat and radiation of the sun. With our ozone nearly 50% destroyed, we will be 50% more exposed to UVB radiation. Photosynthesis would be totally disrupted. Marine and freshwater plankton would die off. All the plants would die off. And there would be a massive extinction event that humans would likely not survive. The truly scary thing is that it could happen at any second, even before you finish watching this video. If you knew today was your last day alive, what would you do? Tell me in the comments below and hit the subscribe button while you're at it. The Sixth Mass Extinction The world is ending as we speak, as scientists say we are currently in the sixth mass extinction of our planet's history. Scientists have analyzed species of life forms and found that billions of regional populations have been lost. They blame overpopulation, greedy human consumption, and say we have a short time to act. This study was done by a large group of scientists and peer-reviewed before being published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. According to these experts and their fields, we are currently experiencing biological annihilation. Billions of individual populations of mammals, birds, and reptiles have been lost all over the planet. And even though over 50% of many individual animal species have been lost, they still aren't considered endangered until they are pretty much on the brink of vanishing. What scientists have concluded is that due to shrinking habitats, human encroachment, mass pollution, but really above all, just not having a place to live, we are experiencing the current annihilation of all life on Earth. Once we have successfully killed every living animal, we will no longer have a way to sustain ourselves and will soon follow the nuclear problem. The latest assessment of Russia's nuclear military capability as of early 22, does not look good. They have a stockpile of an estimated 4,477 nuclear warheads. The United States of America has 3,800 rapidly deployable warheads for a total of 5,500. Scientists have argued that only about 3 million megatons of TNT detonated during all of World War II. This is a stark comparison to the UK Trident submarine's nuclear warheads, which each carry four megatons on all of their 40 armed nuclear warheads. The point is that there's a lot of power out there just waiting to be unleashed. Nuclear war would most likely erase humanity as we know it. A study was published two years ago from top scientists around the world that agreed even a small nuclear contest would result in billions of deaths. The study looked at a conflict between India and Pakistan. They supposed that about a hundred detonations, each the size of the bomb dropped on Hiroshima, went off during the fighting. Direct human deaths would result somewhere in the tens of millions. However, the real impact would be the suit from the explosions getting stuck in the stratosphere and circulating around the globe. Incoming solar radiation would be blocked, the Earth's surface temperature would drop, and rainfall patterns would be dramatically altered. We would live in a world of darkness in which food exports no longer existed. Within the first few years, 
About 1.5 billion would die of starvation alone. The final plague. Humans may be directly responsible for the extinction event we are currently experiencing. But don't worry, the natural world is fighting back, and it has been for a long time. Through sickness and disease, the world is very steadily trying to wipe us out. Fleas stricken with plague showed up in the city of Constantinople back in 541 AD and infected almost everyone. Most people think of the plague from the medieval days, but the one in the 6th century truly did almost wipe out all of humanity. It was called the Plague of Justinian, and it came out of Egypt and spread across Europe, Asia, and North Africa. Somewhere between 30 and 50 million people died, over half the population of the whole world. It would be like if 5 billion people just dropped dead today. Then there was the Black Death that began in Europe somewhere around 1347, killing an estimated 200 million and an estimated one-third of the global population. Then the Great Plague struck London in 1665, killing about 100,000 Londoners. It was the last of the resurfacing plague infections, each of which killed about 20% of people in the capital. The point here is that one day the natural world may just succeed and finally give birth to an infectious disease so terrible that none of us are left standing. Messiah Foundation International The Messiah Foundation International is a spiritual organization, at least that's how they describe themselves. They were established in 2002 and are promoters of the teachings of Goha Shahi, who preaches his very own unique philosophy of divine love. To put it plainly, the organization is a cult hiding under the veil of legitimacy. They were only born as a successor to a previous cult called Rags International, which was created by the same spiritual leader from Pakistan, full name Riaz Ahmed Goha Shahi, back in 1980. What's interesting about this group is that they claim to be the ultimate fulfillment of all the world's religion's prophecies, including Christian, Jewish, Hindu, and Muslim. They also claim to know exactly when the world is going to end. According to the Messiah Foundation International, an asteroid is going to smash into the planet in the year 2026. And according to their spiritual leader, the only hope for humanity is if they can recognize his image on the moon. Yeah, it's about as weird as it sounds. The Rapture Christians don't necessarily have to worry about asteroids or floods or any kind of extreme weather event or geological phenomenon destroying the world. Because for Christians, they have the Rapture to look forward to. The Rapture is the day that Jesus Christ returns and all the believers will be ascended to heaven. The bodies of the dead will be resurrected, and every person who ever lived, assuming they lived by the word of God and never lost their faith, will be brought to paradise to live for eternity. This is the rapture and the end. This great apocalypse will supposedly be in two phases. First, Jesus Christ will come for the believers and take them away. When this is happening, the unbelievers will have no idea. People will just kind of vanish. And that is when the tribulations begin. After seven years since the believers ascended, Jesus Christ will come back and rule the earth for a thousand years with all of his saints. Then, after Jesus is king of the world for an entire millennium, those who are still unbelievers, plus all the wicked people that died before, will be tossed into the lake of fire. The world will be erased so that a new world of heaven and earth may be born. The Life of Nostradamus Nostradamus was born in December of 1503 in the Saint-Rémy de Provence of France. 500 years later and we are still talking about his prophecies. Nostradamus supposedly predicted the French Revolution and the rise of Nazi Germany. He also apparently foretold a pandemic outbreak of 2020, and this was all from a single book that he published in the year 1555 called The Prophecies. Since its initial release, the book has gained a massive amount of attention worldwide, especially because of its final prediction. According to the book, the world will come to a crashing end in the year 3797. But who exactly was Nostradamus? His real name was Michel de Nostradamus, and he was born into a family of grain dealers. His grandfather had only recently converted the family to Catholicism to avoid being brutally tortured during the Spanish Inquisition. 
And while we don't know much about his childhood, we do know that Nostradamus showed signs of extreme intelligence from a young age. He learned many languages and was schooled in mathematics and astrology. Then, at just 14 years old, he attended the University of Avignon. Shortly after he started school, the plague outbreak swept across Europe. He became a traveling doctor, saving plague victims and helping to remove corpses from city streets. In 1538, charges of heresy were brought against Nostradamus, causing him to flee and travel through Italy, Greece, and Turkey. This was when he delved into mysticism. After a few years, he began to have visions. Then, in 1554, he wrote all these visions down with enough prophecies to last the next 2,000 years. Nostradamus and Catherine de' Medici The French queen and wife of King Henry II, Catherine de' Medici, was a stout believer in the prophecies of Nostradamus. After she read his book in 1555, she noticed the prophecy he'd made about her family, so Catherine invited him to Paris. Nostradamus traveled to the capital to meet the queen and draw horoscopes for her children. She soon made him a counselor and physician in her court. This attention was all because of a prophecy in which Nostradamus mentioned a young lion who would overcome an older one on the battlefield. The prediction explained that the young lion would pierce the eyes of the elder lion, who would go on to suffer a cruel death. When Catherine asked Nostradamus what he meant by this, all he said was that the king should avoid any ceremonial jousting. However, nobody could tell King Henry II what to do. Shortly after Nostradamus was summoned by Queen Catherine, King Henry died in a jousting match at 40 years old. Nostradamus's prophecy was exactly correct. The lance from Henry's opponent even pierced his visor, stabbing through his eyeball and impaling his brain. King Henry clung to life for a cruel ten days of agony before the infection finally claimed his life. This was a huge deal for Nostradamus because it confirmed that his prophecies were predictions of the future, and it did this in a huge way. It happened while Nostradamus was still alive, too, bringing him great fame for the rest of his life. World War II Propaganda in World War II, a man named Joseph Goebbels was responsible for the majority of propaganda being distributed throughout Europe and especially to the German people. Shortly after the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, Joseph's wife Magda came upon an old passage in a book attributed to the famous astrologer and oracle Nostradamus. This particular passage suggested that there would be a great crisis in England and Poland in the year 1939. To the Nazis, it seemed like Nostradamus predicted a successful campaign, with Poland being brought to its knees, followed by England. Realizing the opportunity he had, Joseph Goebbels distributed a brochure detailing the ancient prophecy throughout neutral countries in Europe. This was supposed to motivate the neutral territories to side with the Nazis. If Nostradamus was right in his prophecy, it meant Germany's victory was inevitable. The Germans airdropped huge quantities of these flyers as a way to shatter morale. They wanted the enemy to believe the outcome had already been sealed by faith that the Germans would win and that there was no use in fighting back. Nostradamus was a huge part of World War II. As ridiculous as it may seem, the Allies soon learned what the Germans were up to and airdropped their own flyers over territories occupied by the Germans. The Allies' flyers said the complete opposite, that Nostradamus had foreseen the defeat of Germany. To boost American morale, the army even had MGM Studios produce short films about Nostradamus, in which he claimed the Americans would be victorious, not the Nazis. The Great Revolt of 2023 According to Nostradamus himself, the outlook for 2023 isn't great. The French astrologer has made some truly terrifying predictions about what will happen in 2023, including a great war and civil unrest leading to a revolt, the likes of which the modern world has never seen before. He also mentions that something strange will be discovered on Mars. It's believed that the prophecy about the supposed war has to do with Ukraine and Russia. Nostradamus wrote that the war would expand and encapsulate the world. Then there's a line that reads, Celestial fire on the royal edifice. Nobody is entirely sure what it means, but it seems to suggest that a great royal family will go up in flames. 
Nostradamus warned us about the Great Revolt of 2023. He wrote that the sun shall grow so hot that the fish in the sea will boil. He said when Rhodes and Genoa are starved, the local folk will be forced to toil. He also explained that sooner or later, we will see great changes made, dreadful horrors and vengeances. Many believe that this prediction suggests that there will soon be a revolt against the wealthy, and people will start to fight back in response to the plummeting economy. This leads us to Nostradamus's prophecy regarding the Red Planet. He wrote that in 2023, the light on Mars will fall. Yet again, we don't know what he meant by that. Some think it alludes to a Martian colony, but there are no current manned missions planned by anyone on Earth to travel to the Red Planet. The Last President Nostradamus predicted something awful happening in the lands of the West in 2024. He wrote that there would be a great calamity, likely an earthquake that would shake apart the Western lands. He also mentioned Lombardy in Italy, suggesting Europe too will be shocked by abrupt seismic activity. But that's only part of the trouble. There are some who believe Nostradamus predicted the last American president would be elected in 2024. His prophecy says that everyone will put their hopes in him, but it won't turn out. He then goes on to say that as the president solves one crisis, he'll start another. 2024 is set to be a year of economic destruction and natural disaster, and apparently it will be the end of the United States of America. If the last president is elected to office in 2024, that can only mean one of two things. Either democracy dies in the next couple of years, or the country itself falls like the Roman Empire. Which prophecy do you believe more? That the last president of the US will be elected in 2024, or that there will soon be a revolt against the wealthy in 2023? Let us know your thoughts in the comments down below. And while you're at it, hit that subscribe button. World War III one of the issues about the prophecies of Nostradamus is that everyone seems to interpret them a little differently. He also wrote his predictions over 500 years ago, meaning he had absolutely no knowledge of future technologies. It seems unbelievable that a man in the medieval days could have predicted something like nuclear warfare. And yet, there are those who say Nostradamus predicted Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine and its build-up to World War III. In Nostradamus' book of prophecies, 2022 was slated to be a bad year. He predicted a famine so bad that humanity would resort to cannibalism. And although that didn't happen, the world has experienced such a sharp spike in inflation that many people are finding it difficult to feed their families. Nostradamus wrote that honey shall cost more than candle wax and that the price of wheat will soar, adding that men will completely lose hope. And aside from the suggestion of cannibalism, his prophecy yet again makes perfect sense. Wheat is indeed extraordinarily expensive, and the good things in life are costing more and more as time passes. It also wouldn't be far-fetched to say that people are beginning to lose hope in humanity. But it's the next few lines of prophecy that have people really shook up. Nostradamus wrote, Seven months the Great War, people dead of evil doing, Rouen, Evro shall not fall to the king. This suggestion here is that we are in store for a war that will last a total of seven months. That may not seem like a very long time, but it only takes a second to push a button and launch a nuclear warhead. Queen Elizabeth II Nostradamus somehow knew exactly when Queen Elizabeth II would die, even though he couldn't have possibly known she would exist. In a shocking revelation, Nostradamus even predicted the exact age of the late monarch. According to a 2005 translation of Nostradamus's prophecies written by Mario Redding, Queen Elizabeth was predicted to die in the year 2022 at around the age of 96. Nostradamus really hit the nail on the head with that prediction, and everything he said would happen came true. Mario Redding's book became quite popular in the aftermath of Elizabeth's death, with sales rising from just five copies per week to over 8,000. However, there was more to the prophecy than just the death of Queen Elizabeth. The prediction also says the future king, who currently happens to be King Charles III, will abdicate his throne to Prince Harry. The modern translation from Nostradamus's ancient prophecy says that the king will be deemed unworthy by the people. He will then be forced off the throne and replaced by a man who never expected to be king in the first place. 
the rise of Hitler. One of the most famous predictions of Nostradamus was the rise of Adolf Hitler. He predicted that a young child would rise from the depths of Western Europe, whose tongue would go on to seduce a great troop. He also claimed that the child would be born to poor parents. The prediction is so vague that it could mean almost anything. However, many believe that it's referring to the rise of Hitler, who seduced a nation through propaganda and nationalism. Charismatic Hitler used his enthusiasm and wits to convince Germany to go to war, which would explain the part in the prophecy about his seductive tongue. And because we know Hitler was born to a poor family, the second part of the prediction also makes sense. Then again, Nostradamus may not have seen anything coming. Many argue that he had no foresight ability at all. Instead, his predictions were constructed so cryptically and vaguely that they could be interpreted any way the reader wanted. For example, one of his prophecies reads, Within two cities there will be scourges the like of which has never been seen. This could mean anything from a disease outbreak to a natural disaster anywhere in the world. But it has been attributed to the nuclear bombs being dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II. It seems as though people take the vaguest of predictions and then connect them to real-world events. The Antichrist Nostradamus predicted the French Revolution and the rise of the first Antichrist. In fact, he claimed that three Antichrists would rise and trouble the world. Many believe that Napoleon Bonaparte was the first Antichrist, founder of the First Empire of France, and a man who tried to conquer the world. The second was almost definitely Adolf Hitler, the German Chancellor who tried to rule Europe and committed atrocities against the Jewish people. However, the third Antichrist remains unknown. It's important to remember that Nostradamus was French. The majority of his predictions pertain to France and the French people. For example, he prophesied that from the enslaved people, songs, chants, and demands, lords and princes would be held captive in prisons. He wrote these predictions cryptically, but they do make sense. He foretold the French Revolution and that the royal family would be taken prisoner, almost being wiped out. He also predicted the corruption of the early leaders of the revolution. The aristocracy lost their estates, and the revolution leaders had their heads chopped off at the guillotine before Napoleon Bonaparte rose up to seize power. Napoleon was not a king, but an emperor like in the days of Rome. His campaign across the globe, spanning Italy, Egypt, and even Moscow, cost millions of French people their lives. All of this was seen and predicted in advance by Nostradamus. The Predictions of Baba Vanga There was once a Bulgarian mystic woman by the name of Baba Vanga, and she's been compared directly to Nostradamus because of her bizarre predictions of the future. Much like how Nostradamus saw the world coming to an end by 3797, Baba Vanga saw the conclusion of life on Earth. The only difference is that she predicted that the complete destruction of the human race would come in the year 5079. That's not for 3,000 years, but it doesn't mean things will go smoothly until then. Baba Vanga, who lived between 1911 and 1996, spent her entire life completely blind, and she predicted that 2023 would be a very bad year. She foretold a nuclear explosion so powerful it would shift the orbit of our planet. She also prophesied a solar storm that would bathe the Earth in radiation. She even predicted there would be the appearance of hostile aliens. One of the reasons Baba Vanga isn't taken as seriously as Nostradamus is that her predictions are a little more unusual. She believed that by 2023, humans would be manufactured in laboratories and not born in hospitals. And according to her, a human astronaut would land on Venus by 2028, which seems extremely unlikely. Looking to the stars One little-known fact about the Vatican is that they're on a mission to study alien life using the latest advancements in scientific technology. The Vatican has a private observatory that's used by its own astronomers. The Vatican is now the one combing the skies for extraterrestrial life, 400 years after the church locked up Galileo for his theories on the universe. Reverend Jose Gabriel Foniz, who worked as an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory, says the possibility of life out in the universe deserves serious consideration. Foniz is a Jesuit priest who leads a team of physicists, biologists, and astronomers in studying the cosmos and the origin of life. 
The Catholic Church has certainly come a long way since the year 1600, which is when they burned philosopher Giordano Bruno at the stake for speculating there could be another world inhabited by other creatures. Now the Vatican is the one actively searching for these supposed aliens. The Church says the existence of extraterrestrial beings would not contradict faith in God, but would instead show the unimaginable scope of God's creativity. Then again, maybe the Vatican is up to something they aren't sharing with us. Perhaps they're trying to find the aliens before the rest of the world so they can control the narrative or bury the information altogether. The Ark of the Alien Covenant The Ark of the Covenant is one of the most coveted religious artifacts in the world. In the Bible, the Ark is a wooden chest covered in solid gold, complete with a luxuriously decorated lid and two long golden staves for carrying the chest. Within the Ark are the two stone tablets which contain the Ten Commandments, handed down from God to Moses. The treasure was last seen in Solomon's Temple before the Babylonians attacked Jerusalem between 597 and 586 BC. Unfortunately, the location of the Ark has been a mystery ever since. But what if the Ark wasn't just a container for the Ten Commandments? Some say the Ark of the Covenant was a highly advanced piece of technology used by the Israelites to communicate with beings beyond the stars. After all, it was Moses speaking directly with God who wrote down the commandments. It makes sense that the story has some connection to reality. Legend has it that when the Ark was used, an image of God would appear over the chest, almost like a hologram. And as you may know already, gold is used in smartphones across the world to communicate across huge distances. If there was an alien communication device needed to speak with beings across galaxies, chances are it would need to be made of solid gold, just like the Ark. However, as with most conspiracy theories surrounding the Church and extraterrestrial life, this one is impossible to find evidence for. Nobody knows where the Ark is today, or if it ever existed in the first place. Jesus the Alien Many believe that Jesus Christ was an alien being, and if he wasn't, then his resurrection was carried out by aliens. There is an argument that Jesus' supernatural powers can be attributed to the fact that he didn't come from this planet. The Aetherius Society, a religious group some call a cult, believes in this theory wholeheartedly. Their entire religion is based around Jesus having been a cosmic missionary who revealed himself to the people of Earth 2,000 years ago. We know Jesus taught his disciples all about goodness to one another and how to live life as a decent person. The God he allegedly preached about was not the angry God of vengeance from the Bible, but rather a God who created all matter and things that exist in the universe. According to the Aetherius Society, Jesus was part of an interplanetary mission to bring awareness of the cosmic God to the primitive inhabitants of backwater worlds like Earth. Then, when he was butchered by humans, his fellow extraterrestrials resurrected him and he returned to space. Jesuits and Area 51 To be a Jesuit is to be a member of the Society of Jesus. You may have heard of the Jesuits before, although they've largely fallen out of the public view in the last few decades. They started as an order of priests for the Roman Catholic Church in 1540. They were missionaries whose duty was to oppose the Reformation and to spread the word of Christ across the world. Their headquarters is set up in Rome, and they've participated in the evangelization of the citizens of at least 112 different nations. Because the Jesuits are such an old order, it should come as no surprise that they're at the center of many conspiracy theories. As early as 1551, the Jesuits were described as a fraternity of priests who didn't believe in Jesus. For the first century of their operation, many people across the globe thought they were trying to infiltrate various political circles outside the Catholic Church. Allegedly, their end goal was to secure alliances for global domination. Over the years, the conspiracy theories have gotten even more outrageous. Some claim the Jesuits were behind the French Revolution in the 17th century. The Jesuits were also supposedly responsible for the sinking of the Titanic. J.P. Morgan allegedly had a meeting with the Jesuits in 1910, and the two parties came to a mutual agreement. They would dominate the central banking system. However, in order to do this, they needed to get rid of certain influential businessmen. To take care of these businessmen, including Isidore Strauss and Benjamin Guggenheim, the Jesuits hatched a plan to sink the Titanic with them on board. Some people even believe the Jesuits had something to do with the Roswell crash in New Mexico in 1947. None of the theories have ever been proved, but that doesn't mean they aren't true. Aliens in the Vatican 
In 2016, hackers broke into the private email account of John Podesta, Hillary Clinton's campaign chairman at the time. They were hoping to dig up dirt on Hillary, but instead they revealed a strange UFO conspiracy. Inside the emails was a shocking revelation that one of the most powerful people in Washington knows about the existence of alien beings. One of the emails was from June 25, 2014, between Podesta and NASA astronaut Edgar Mitchell. He was quoted in the email as requesting a conversation with Edgar and President Barack Obama regarding the disclosure of extraterrestrial life for the benefit of Earth. Out of all the conspiracy theories regarding UFOs, Area 51, and secret government X-Files, this is by far the most legitimate proof we have of alien life. Podesta is one of the main men in Washington, and we have evidence of him speaking with a NASA astronaut about celestial beings operating within our solar system. To make things even more outrageous, Edgar Mitchell died in February of 2016 before anyone could ask him the truth of what happened. It's also been suggested that the Vatican shares the same knowledge of alien beings as the government, and that they're fully aware of an imminent alien invasion. It's shout-out time! I wanted to give a big thank you to Kirito Terry 567 and Halal Hassan for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries, or dinosaurs, or alien conspiracy theories, guardian angels, and UFOs. There's a conspiracy theory in circulation that states aliens were present for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ roughly 2,000 years ago. The theory comes from a very mysterious painting located in the country of Georgia. The artwork is housed within the Svetitskaveli Cathedral, and it depicts the crucifixion of the Son of God. We see Christ hung on the cross in the portrait, a large temple wall looming in the background, and unidentified flying objects hovering in the sky. One of the objects is red, the other is blue, and they almost look like flying jellyfish pods. The cathedral is an official UNESCO World Heritage Site in the ancient town of Mscheta. The painting was likely made in the Byzantine period during the 11th century. And while it does seem to show a pair of UFOs in the sky, religious scholars say that couldn't be further from the truth. Andrew Gould, an expert in Eastern Orthodox art, says the red and blue jellyfish-looking spacecraft are really just depictions of the sun and moon. Back then, the sun and moon were typically included in Byzantine artwork showing the crucifixion. They are supposed to be references to the Gospel, which explains that after Jesus Christ died, the sky went completely black for three hours. Still, there are many who believe the Church is hiding a much larger secret that has been hidden in their artwork. It could very well be that on the day of Christ's death, aliens watched from above, Mona Lisa and the alien High Priest. Proof of alien life may just be hiding in the Mona Lisa, one of Leonardo da Vinci's greatest masterpieces. Conspiracy theorists claim there is an alien high priest concealed in the painting. These theorists supposedly identified the priest's facial features, a mysterious headdress, and hands, all hidden within the 16th century painting. Leonardo was already known for deliberately concealing secret messages and codes in his work, especially the Last Supper. But when it comes to the Mona Lisa, the group of theorists say it was painted to conceal important historical facts regarding extraterrestrials in the Roman Catholic Church. Da Vinci may have had some knowledge of alien beings operating in the Church. Many people believe he tried to reveal this knowledge as best as he could through hints and secret images in his work, just like the High Priest that's supposedly hidden within the Mona Lisa, the Gathering Storm. In 2020, a UFO was spotted over the Vatican. UFO and conspiracy theorists believe the aliens were hanging around the Vatican to gather information. Either the Vatican is fully aware of the aliens creeping around their city, or they are stubbornly ignorant. All we know for sure is that something strange was recorded on the Vatican media live stream of St. Peter's Basilica on October 16th of that year. The live stream is a 24-7 broadcast, which looks across the famous Piazza San Pietro, also known as St. Peter's Square. Anyone can tune into the live stream to see what's happening in front of the Vatican at any time of day. The anomaly was spotted hovering over the roof of the Basilica by Scott C. Waring, self-appointed UFO hunter. He saw a dark oval splotch that almost looked like it was being hidden by highly advanced camouflage. The object had no obvious shape, but appeared to be a smudge in the sky. Sadly, there is no indisputable way to prove there are aliens lurking over Vatican City, but the sighting was strange enough that it got people all over the world talking. 
Some are now wondering what kind of information the Vatican may have that the aliens are interested in. The Alien Girl of Chile In 2003, a man in Chile uncovered a mysterious skeleton in the Atacama Desert. The man was something of a scavenger, regularly searching through the abandoned town of La Noria for any potential treasure he could get his hands on. He was digging near a forgotten church in the area when he came across a rather unusual skeleton. The discovery took the world by storm that year. It was on the front page of just about every newspaper in the world, since the skeleton looked like it belonged to a tiny extraterrestrial being. People called it a humanoid monster, an alien, and even a mutant. But in truth, the skeleton likely belonged to a human girl. The skeleton is highly unusual because it's only 6 inches 15 centimeters tall. It's so small it can fit in the palm of your hand. When scientists from Stanford University removed a small rib fragment and did a DNA analysis, the results came back as human. The so-called alien skeleton turned out to be a small human girl who only grew to be less than a foot tall. But how could this be possible? And why was it found near the ruined church of an abandoned town in a Chilean desert? Unfortunately, nobody has been able to answer these questions. Scientists argue the girl was likely the victim of some disease that prevented her bones from growing. Another explanation is that she could have been a stillbirth and never fully lived. Others argue she was the failed experiment of aliens mixing their own DNA with that of humans. The failed genetic experiment was then discovered by priests in the small town and the skeleton was then buried behind the church to conceal the horror of what they'd seen. Alien Gargoyle At a 12th century Scottish abbey, there is a gargoyle emerging from the side of the building that clearly has no business being there. The gargoyle isn't your typical beast hunched over a stone drainpipe. Instead, this one is a very obvious extraterrestrial being. It looks like the alien creature from the Alien franchise with a long, slick head, sharp claws, and a mouth full of pointy teeth. But what in the world is this thing doing at a 12th century abbey? The medieval site is called Paisley Abbey, and although it was built 900 years ago, its history goes back much further. The area was established as a community by Saint Mirren in the 7th century. After his death, a shrine was built in his honor. This became a popular pilgrimage site, and a small monastery was established here in 1163. A group of monks arrived to tend to the priory, and by 1245, Paisley had earned itself the status of abbey. However, in the years that followed, the structure experienced a very difficult time. Edward I of England burned the building down in 1307. It was rebuilt in the 14th century, but once again fell into disrepair. Throughout the 15th and 16th centuries, a series of fires left the abbey in a state of ruin. The tower collapsed and most of the structure was plundered for stone. It was almost completely in shambles by the 19th century, but it was saved just in the nick of time, and by 1928, the building was reconstructed. Now let's get back to the significance of the gargoyle alien at one of the holiest places in Scotland. In 1991, Paisley Abbey underwent restoration work. Twelve of its gargoyles were extremely damaged and had to be removed altogether. When the stonemasonry company behind the work replaced the gargoyles with newer models, they made one into a xenomorph from the Alien movies, just for fun. Even though it looks like the alien was crafted by the original builders, it's only about three decades old. Do you think the church could be in cahoots with an alien civilization? Let us know what you think in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Bye.